Well, today I want to start off by talking about shells. You walk on the beach, they're all over the place, they're beautiful. Yeah, they might be have different shapes, different sizes. They're, in fact, you see lots of little kids picking them up and holding on to them. Shells, other than being a really beautiful thing, it's a kind of a safety device. Animals inside of it, they're armored, things can't get into them. But really, shells play a really huge role in determining geologic history. And paleontologists have used shells to really learn about our Earth. In today's video, we're going to see how they've used one type of shell to understand the entire, all of geologic history, all of Earth's past. Well, in this video, we're going to do three things. We're going to, one, understand how the Earth's history has been broken down and categorized. And really, that's going to come down again to our shells, a type of animal called a brachiopod, which we'll get to. Two, we're going to understand how paleontologists have came up with these categories. How do they give them names? Then lastly, we're going to recognize and identify some of the major breakdowns of our, what is now called the geologic time scale. So look for those three things and make sure you're writing that in your Cornell note sheet, those targets. Well, let's go back and look at brachiopods. Brachiopods are a shelled animal. They kind of look similar to a, a clam, but they're a little bit different. Um, they're not a dinosaur. It kind of sounds that way. Maybe we've heard of Brachiosaurus, which is a type of dinosaur. They're not dinosaurs. They're an, actually a mollusk um, that lives on the bottom of the ocean in bays. There's lots of them. But because of a couple things, brachiopods make really easy fossils. For one, they have that hard shell, and hard things like to fossilize much easier than things like soft tissue and muscle and things like that. So, very easily fossilized that way. Two, they live on muddy floors where mud can cover them and form fossils. So we have lots of brachiopod fossils. The other thing, too, is let's for say some predator was able to get into the brachiopod and eat what's inside of it. The, fall, the shell would still fall out to the bottom of the ocean or the bay or wherever they're at, and it would be fossilized. So we have lots of brachiopod fossils. They're all over the place. Well, another feature of a brachiopod that makes it unique is that life on our planet has been around for about 500 million years. We're going to talk about later how we get that number. But brachiopods have been around for most of that time. And they've changed somewhat over time. And as we go through, we're going to see how they might have changed as we go through our geologic time scale. So those things make brachiopods a really easy fossil to look at. One, there's a lot of them. Two, that they have been around for a long time and that they've changed somewhat over time. Well, in the 18th and 19th century, paleontologists started to look at layers of the earth. And a lot of this was done in England, so you're going to see a lot of English names. And they are noticing something. In certain layers of sedimentary rock, that there were certain types of brachiopod fossils. In one layer, they might find brachiopod A. In the next layer, they might find A and B. And they might say, find just B in the next. And, well, and it would just change throughout. They looked at every different layer. They're also able to find layers across the area that were the same. So maybe they found a rock layer here in Sandy. They could go into, let's say, Vernonia or Forest Grove and find the same layer. So they're able to kind of tie things together by looking at these brachiopod fossils. Well, what was really interesting, though, was the fact that they were different. All the different layers may have different types of brachiopod fossils. And they started to name the layers based on where they found them. So, for instance, the layer that they found in Cambridge, they called the Cambrian. The layer that they found in Mississippi, they called it the Mississippian. The layer they found in the Jurassic, in the uh, Jura Mountains, they called it the Jurassic. Based on where they found the layer, they named it based upon where they found it. Well, instead of just calling it layers, they decided they call that a period. Because everything, all the fossils that happened in that layer, happened at the same time. So it was, for instance, the Cambrian period, the Jurassic period, the Mississippian period. Or we can go through lots of other ones, the Devonian period. Right? The Pennsylvania period, there's tons of them. And you look at a geologic time scale, you can see in the middle, usually, there is these things called periods. Well, what you're really seeing is just a grouping of brachiopod fossils and everything that goes with it. So, geologists and paleontologists now had a way where they could have categories of different types of fossils. And they put them based upon where they found them. They found them at the bottom, they put them at the bottom of their scale, and they found them at the top, they put them at the top. 
Well, they were starting to be kind of, um, well, they started to see similarities between the layers. The different periods had different had similarities. For instance, the ones towards the bottom had simpler forms of life. So they started to call those the Paleozoic periods because there, uh, there wasn't their early life. Paleo means old, so old life. They found some that had these things dinosaurs, these giant lizards and reptiles. Not lizards, but reptiles. They called those the middle life, the Mesozoic. Then they found above that they had modern life, mammals, things that we would recognize today, and they called that the Cenozoic. All of those are a category called eras. So we have periods and then eras, and eras are made up of a multiple couple periods. Well, then they also saw that the eras had similarities. Those first three I told you all had life in them. So they called all of those an era, the Phanozoic era. And before that, there was other ones like the Paleozoic era, and you can see, I'm sorry, Protozoic, not Paleozoic. So you have breaks up, breakups of how we can do our geologic time scale. You have at one area, we have really large breakups, eons. Then you have eras and periods based upon these fossils. Now, there's even smaller ones called epochs, which are even smaller within they make up a period. Oh, we don't need to get into them too much. But the idea here is that based on fossils, we could categorize different layers of rock. Right? If you had a brachiopod fossil that all had fossil A, you could put all of those together. So, based upon these brachiopods, they are able to construct our geologic time scale, and we talked about those three things. So, let's take a look at what we talked about in our video that kind of will sum it up. One, we'll understand how the Earth's history has been broken down and categorized. Right? It's been broken down into periods, eras, and eons, and that's all based upon these little brachiopod fossils. Two, understand how paleontologists came up with these category names. Well, especially periods, they use the location of where they found the fossils to come up with the name of the period. And then, based upon some of the similarities, they made eras and eons. Recognize the basic breakdowns, as we just said, right? That uh, we've talked about eons, eras, and periods. And if you really want to get technical and look into it, you can have epochs, which are even smaller period, smaller sections of a period. So, remember, as these videos work, you can always go back if I went too fast. You can hit pause if there's something you want to spend a little bit more time on. You can rewind it, watch it again, but always remember just to keep moving forward.